Good morning, Zion. You belong here. We belong together. Today we are celebrating the 14th Sunday after Pentecost. Zion Lutheran Church is hosting live in-person corporate worship, and I want you to be aware that we have a blended service on Saturday evening at 5 p.m. and a traditional liturgical service on Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m., but not this week. If you're curious about attending worship at Zion during the pandemic, then I would encourage you to go to the website zionohio.org and watch a video that we released that talks about all the conditions that must be met as you enter the building and extend until you leave the building. But not this week. Now, if you're wondering why I keep saying not this week, that is because we are temporarily closed for corporate worship because of some major work being done in the sanctuary. The pews have been removed. The new paint is starting to go up. After the paint, the floors underneath the pews will be replaced, and then this blue carpet will be changed. You want to see what it looks like right now? Watch this. So, as you can see, the video is now cockeyed. I'll fix that before we go on to the prayer of the day and so on. But as you can see, the building, the sanctuary, is void of almost everything. I usually do these videos with no one in the building, but now it's even more pathetic with no furniture in the building. Well, anyway, what will happen this coming weekend? You'll be watching this video. What will happen the weekend after that? I don't know. It sure does seem like the progress is going slow. Only two guys are painting in here, but we shall see. I would encourage you to continue to watch all the normal Zion news outlets for the information about whether we have services the following week or not. By the way of announcements, our second annual God's Work Our Hands Day of Service cleanup of Cornersburg will be happening on Saturday, September the 12th. It was a big hit last year, and so I'm anticipating that many of you will show up once again. We will begin with a hearty breakfast at 8 o'clock and a brief devotion after that, and then we will go out and hit the streets cleaning up the sidewalks and gutters of Cornersburg. Rally Day will be that Sunday, Sunday, September the 13th, but to start the Sunday School program year, Sunday School will be a virtual distance learning experience. Look for more information to come out of Zion's normal news outlets. What's Cooking at Zion is back with a drive through turkey dinner on Thursday, September the 17th. You need to contact the office to reserve your meals. Later that same evening, Stephanie Chismart, director of choirs, will start the bell choir season. Tired of not being able to sing? Then ring. Our next food distribution will be Saturday, September the 19th. If you can help with the distribution, just show up that Saturday morning about 9 a.m. Our next Red Cross blood drawing will be Thursday, September the 24th from 1 to 6 p.m. For your convenience, I would encourage you to schedule your donation by calling 1-800-RED-CROSS or by going to the website redcrossblood.org and entering the keyword Zion Canfield or by searching any local blood drawing that is convenient to you. You can read about all this and much more in the September edition of Ion Zion that has been mailed to your mailbox. If you want to receive the weekly edition of Ion Zion, I would encourage you to go to the website zionohio.org and click on the subscribe button where you can receive that, the daily word, the occasional word, the occasional emails that we send out regarding news and information about members and activities around the campus. I want to thank you for your continued financial support. To make an offering, we suggest using the zionohio.org website and clicking on the Give tab. 
or you can use the Give Plus smartphone app from your app store, or you can text to give. Just text this number, 833-409-0694, and then in the body itself, text the word assist, and then follow the prompts. You, of course, can still reach us by the U.S. mail. Assisting in worship today are Joan Gent, our Administrator of Worship and Music on the keyboards. Carrie Jennings will be leading us in our singing and providing special music. And Scott Ackerman, the leader of our Pray Table, will be leading us in our prayers of intercession. Now I invite you to sing along as we join in singing our gathering hymn. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O Lord God, enliven and preserve your church with your perpetual mercy. Without your help, we mortals will fail. Remove far from us everything that is harmful and lead us toward all that gives life and salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, Amen. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to the disciples, If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you were not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among you. The Gospel of the Lord. This passage is known in many circles simply as Matthew 18. 
It is an important discipline for the church given to us by the Lord Jesus himself. And the ELCA has wisely included it in the model constitution by which all ELCA churches are to operate. Those of you who can put your finger on a copy of Zion's constitution, check me out on this. It is chapter 15 in our constitution. However, I often find that it is one of the most ignored by most of our church members. So I am going to briefly walk through it with you. We have to go back to the beginning of chapter 18 to see who Jesus is speaking to. And when we do that, we read that this conversation took place between Jesus and his disciples. So the first thing we need to know is that the conversation is not a conversation with the general public or the priesthood or the Pharisees or the Sadducees or the scribes or any of the adversaries that Jesus had. No, this is a conversation that he has with his disciples, that ragtag cadre of followers with whom Jesus will soon be giving the responsibility for nurturing his bride, the church. The second thing I want you to know is who this discipleship lesson is directed to. In verse 15, Jesus said, if another member of the church sins against you, and so on. Here I would like to point out that only two writers in all of scripture use the word church. Luke uses it generously in his writing of Acts, and Matthew uses it five times in his gospel that bears his authorship, this being the second time, the first one being the confession of Peter that we heard two weeks ago when Peter correctly identified Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of the living God, and Jesus responded by saying, on this rock I will build my church. So this concept of a spiritual body, an organization, an institution is just beginning to be talked about by Jesus and the Twelve. But already in this passage, Jesus said, my followers will behave differently than the rest of the population. And how is that? I'm so glad you asked. His instructions are the gospel reading. He writes, rather, he said, If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. This may just qualify as the most overlooked directive straight from Jesus' mouth in all of Scripture. Yeah, I said that. We think that we are Christians and we need to just forgive and forget and so we forgive without ever letting the other person know that offended us that they have indeed offended us. And then we never really forget because we have been hurt and we don't like that and since we never pointed out the hurt, the other person may not be aware that they hurt us and so, in fact, it may happen again. Not fair, said Jesus. You should go to them. But I don't want to hurt their feelings. If Jesus lived in our day, he would say, do not enable their bad behavior. If they hurt you, they may well hurt others. Do not allow this to happen. For your sake and for the rest of the fellowship, love them enough to stop them. And you know something else? Your hurt is not your offender's problem. It's your problem. They may not even be aware that they've offended you. So what are you going to do with your problem? Are you going to sit on it and let it fester? Are you never going to speak to that person again? Are you going to talk about them behind their backs to others? A true story will illustrate this lesson. I had an incident several years ago in the little church up north where one member didn't like something I said or did. To be honest with you, I don't remember what the incident was. 
and he began to tell other peoples, don't listen to him. He further began to stir up trouble among the fellowship and even made a scene at a congregation meeting. Now, I am not aware of a single person in the fellowship who hadn't already dismissed him as an agitator, but I had to confront him and ask him to stop this bad behavior. He did not make that easy for me either. He refused to meet with me to even discuss it, and eventually he took his membership elsewhere. And while you may think that this is a terrible example of Jesus's model, he made his bad behavior become my problem, and I dealt with it according to this passage. And as a result, I believe that we still consider each other friends, and I hope that he learned something about appropriate behavior within the church. Now you may want to ask me why I would make that effort. After all, there are problem people everywhere we go. The answer is because I loved him enough as a brother in Christ that I was not going to allow him to become lost to Christ. Now I'm going to tell you that I have messed up a few things myself. Oh, I know, hard to believe, but it's true. Probably more times than I know. And I say that because though I hope you love me enough to point out my mistakes, all churches lose members all the time, and many times I, as this church's pastor, have no idea why they left. And when I inquire, I get nothing. This church, its pastor, its members, the Christian life is apparently not worth much more to them, so they just go on to some other church that they hope is less sinful. Or worse yet, they just go away and fall among the unchurched. So let's covenant with each other right now. Love me enough to talk with me about your upset, and I promise to love you enough to do the same. And why would we covenant to do that? Because Jesus said in verse 15b, if the member listens to you, you have regained that one. Peace is restored between the two, and peace is restored within the larger community. No one is taken sides. There are no sides except the side of Christ, right? But what if the offender does not listen to the one who was offended? I'm so glad you asked. Jesus has an answer for that as well. He said, But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and tax collector. You know, I have noticed that some people are just stubborn and won't listen to anyone. Jesus provided us with a way to pursue our case so that we might get justice. But notice that it never ends in the legal system. No, Jesus' system keeps the dispute within the fellowship of believers, where love and grace and mercy are supposed to prevail. At the end of the process, if the offender still does not apologize, they should be excluded from the fellowship. Now, I have to admit, I have never had to take a party to that end, to exclude them from the fellowship. But in the case I mentioned a few moments ago, I entered into that process called forth by the Constitution, which is Jesus's process and it is very disheartening. Thankfully, it never had to go to that end. But the point is, I handled it appropriately, even though it was difficult, and I believe I could call that man on the phone today or knock on his door, and he would probably just about do anything that I asked of him, and I would do the same. He was in attendance at the last community service I preached at in Cortland, and 
uh, he wished me God's blessings as I moved on and shook my hand. Though he is no longer a member of the Lutheran Fellowship in Cortland, he's a member of another Christian church, and more importantly, he is a member of the kingdom of God. But the process does not end there. Jesus said, if the offender won't even listen to you and a couple of others or the church, then you are to treat them as stubborn and obstinate people like Gentiles and tax collectors, those who are unrepentant and sinful and unclean and in need of hearing the gospel more effectively. Listen to me again as I repeat that. If, then, they continue to not apologize, they are to be treated as stubborn and obstinate people like the Gentiles and tax collectors, those who were unrepentant and sinful and unclean and in need of hearing the gospel more effectively. Yep, you heard me right. Though Jesus told his disciples to exclude them from the community of faith and treat them like Gentiles and tax collectors, weren't those the very ones that Jesus sought out to demonstrate the gospel to? And so you see, relationship building for the sake of the gospel never ends. There is no one outside the loving reach of our Heavenly Father. God desires that all are included, and so our work of reconciliation never ends. So here's my raise in the bar challenge for you this week. I know conflict is difficult, especially among the fellowship of believers, but avoiding it will simply allow hurt to fester, and sadly some might fall to inactivity and miss out on the many benefits of a life within the fellowship. Take this teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ to heart. If there is hurt that you have felt that just won't heal, seek out that one who hurt you and humbly tell them about it. There should be none of that in the fellowship of believers. Do you love them enough to do the work to restore that relationship? And if you are someone who has offended someone else, whether you are aware of it or not, hear out that one who was offended. You probably didn't mean to hurt them, and now that you know, you'd ought to apologize. Recognize that they brought the offense to your attention because they love you that much. It is the will of our Heavenly Father and our Lord Jesus Christ that at least those within the church ought to be in loving relationships with one another. Let us pray. Loving and merciful God, your Son and our Lord went to the cross as the greatest example of love, grace, and mercy the world has ever known. Invade our proud and sinful consciences with your Holy Spirit that we will be more inclined to love and forgive each other. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
have been made God's people through our baptism into Christ, living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith by reciting the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Drawn together by the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Unite your church, O God. Give to all the baptized the gifts of repentance and reconciliation. Strengthen ecumenical partnerships and interracial cooperation among the churches. Guide the work of the Lutheran World Federation and the World Council of Churches. Lord, in your mercy. Protect your creation, O God. Teach us ways to live that do not harm what you have entrusted to our care. Give to the animals the habitat they need for life. Renew and enliven places suffering from drought, flood, storms, and pollution. Lord, in your mercy. Bless the nations, O God. Frustrate the designs of dictators. Give to the military a clear and moral purpose. Guide legislators, civil servants, judges, and police toward the well-being of all. Infuse the coming election season with honesty and integrity. Lord, in your mercy. Sustain us in our work, O God, and give employment to those who need it. Shape societies to ensure fair treatment for all who labor. Help us to love our neighbors in and through our work. Lord, in your mercy. Guide our civil discourse, O God. Alert us to social evils and show our nation how to end the patterns of racial injustice. Accompany all who are endeavoring to bring about a renewed society and curb the violence in our cities. Lord, in your mercy. Tend to all in need, O God. Assist all friends and family members who are seeking restored relationships. Give community to the lonely and welcome to the outcast. Shelter all who are vulnerable in body, mind, and spirit, especially those on our prayer list, our homebound, and those we now name before you either silently or aloud. Lord, in your mercy. Receive once again, O God, our plea for the end of the coronavirus. Comfort those afflicted and uphold our medical workers. Give us a sense of responsibility for others and provide the world a vaccine. Lord, in your mercy. We remember with thanksgiving those who have died in faith. As you equip them, equip us with your protection and power until we see your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. You have set before us these gifts of your good creation. Prepare us for your heavenly banquet Nourish us with this rich food and drink, and send us forth to set tables in the midst of a suffering world. Through the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 
Now, join in singing our sending hymn. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine on us and be gracious to us. The Lord look upon us with favor and give us peace. Amen. You belong here. We belong together. Go in peace. Remember the poor. Thanks be to God.